You know, native people's lives are far more entwined with nature than our own. As they search for their daily needs, they have to be acutely aware of all the uses of the trees and plants that surround them. But if there's one tree that stands out alone in nature for its usefulness, it has to be this one, the birch tree. There's almost no end to the uses this tree's been put to, from making teacups and cooking pots to canoes. It's even home to a fungus you can use to sharpen your knife. And now in springtime, the birch gives a nourishing, sugary sap that can be used to make one of the best cups of woodsman's tea. So today, I'm going to show you how. What we need to do is to make a small incision into the bark with a knife. There already, look, you see the sap starting to flow down the knife. If I just catch that, wow, brilliant. Slightly sugary, safe to drink, it's lovely. I'll just put a wooden stick in here now. That'll encourage the sap to run down into a container we can place below it. Now that won't harm the tree, and we'll be able to come back and use the sap to make tea later on. Well, wherever you find birch trees, you're also going to find fungi. And in most of the British Isles, it's going to be this one. This is the birch bracket. You can't eat it, but it has got a lot of uses. If I cut it through, you can see that it has a very clean white flesh and it's very sort of rubbery, almost leathery feel to it. Now the common English name for this fungus is the razor strop fungus. And the reason for that is that the flesh used to be dried and stuck onto boards like this and used to sharpen uh, razors, the old cutthroat razor, or I use it to sharpen my knife. It puts just a nice finish on the edge. And I've got a piece of paper. It wasn't a good script anyway, but I'm going to be needing my knife because I want to show you some bark. Come with me. This is just perfect, the birch bark peeling off of a fallen dead branch. The bark is full of oil and often lives much longer than the tree itself, which will rot with inside it. And it's leathery, very flexible. So what I'm going to do is clean it up and make it into a cup. What I've also done is cut a small stick and split the end of it like an old-fashioned clothes peg. But now comes the really tricky bit. What I've got to do is fold this bark into a cone shape. Now I take that stick and I just put that down there a handle. There you go, a perfect cup for a woodsman to drink his tea from. But it's been about three hours since we tapped the tree. Should have some sap by now. Oh yeah, look at that, brilliant. You know, this sap is almost like the life of the season and it's become a bit of a ritual for me to drink this every year. Mmm. Ah, oh, it's great. But I'm going to save the rest and make some tea with it. In a few hours, this will seal itself over and the flow of the sap will stop. To make a good woodsman's tea, I heat the birch sap. And then taking a handful of pine needles, which are packed full of vitamin C and a really sweet flavour, I cut them up and then steep them in that hot sap then strain the tea through some sedge leaves. You can't beat pine needle tea made with birch sap. Mmm, really good. And finally, one last homegrown use for birch trees. In the Middle Ages, fishermen in Northumberland used to take strips of birch bark, stuff them in the end of a cleft stick and set them ablaze and with these attract fish to their spears at night. You know, some people say that birch trees are weeds, but I don't believe this. 
They truly are the woodsman's friend. This is Horsey Island, surrounded by a thousand hectares of salt marsh. OK, it might not look much, but some would say it's the UK equivalent of the rainforest. It's endangered and teeming with wildlife. I'm yet to be convinced. In fact, for the rare avocet, the southeast Anglia are a vital habitat. It's a landscape also enjoyed by the black-headed gull, chicks safely hidden. Food is plentiful, incredible numbers of invertebrates creating a rich protein soup. These are the meadows of the sea and, and this wave energy which you can see here is chipping away at this fragile egg. A thousand chipping hammers the whole time and today is not a particularly rough day. But you've got to bear in mind that as that mud is washed away and on a good storm this whole salt marsh could shoot back a metre. But that mud is then recycled back into the creeks and it then goes back into the salt marsh itself. So although it washes away, it has a habit and a way and a natural process of maintaining itself. So you have a loss here and a gain there. And all the time rising out of the sea as sea level rises. It's a self-sustaining system. Yet it's the changing nature of salt marshes that makes them fascinating. They're one of nature's original recyclers. Mud lost in one place is soon deposited elsewhere, creating another rich plant habitat for species like sea lavender. I suppose the problem with salt marshes is that they don't have a very sexy image. I mean, it's a bit difficult to get people to sit up and take notice of a pile of mud. They could go for Salt Marsh Awareness Day, an information centre or maybe display boards, but oh no, down here they really do things differently. Allegedly, the locals have been indulging in this bizarre practice for over a century. And you seriously think this will make people realise what fun places salt marshes are? I think so, yeah. <laughs> All societies make use of their surroundings and uh, us marsh people make use of what we've got and have done for generations. It's your mother, your mother Earth. So as you go down sliding in it, give it a kiss hello. Give it a try. This man is asking an awful lot. <laughs> okay. And so Mother Earth and I were united.